Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for, uh, for coming to CSIS this morning. Uh, we, uh, we'd like to welcome you all here. Uh, we have a program today uh, that, that looks, uh, looks at the U.S.-New Zealand relationship and we'll also launch a new study by CSIS. We have four speakers um, in order, uh, it would be John Mullen, the president of the U.S.-New Zealand Council. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about the study itself, and we'll hear from uh, Ambassador Mike Moore, the new uh, New Zealand ambassador to the United States, and, and finally, uh, Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and the Pacific, Kurt Campbell. Uh, I'd like to um, kick off directly uh, by inviting my colleague John Mullen, the President of the U.S. New Zealand Council, to make a few comments. John. Thanks, Ernie. Uh, we're here today, uh, as Ernie said, to uh, present and launch um, an important study being undertaken by CSIS uh, on the strategic aspects of the United States-New Zealand um, uh, relationship. Uh, my council, the U.S.-New Zealand Council, and our counterpart um, in New Zealand, the NZUS Council, uh, are proud to be the major sponsors of the study, which is, which is being carried out in, in partnership with the uh, New Zealand Institute of International Affairs uh, in Wellington. Um, Ernie will uh, describe uh, uh, for you the scope of the study, the process, and the objectives. What I'd like to do is to spend a moment on, on why this is important um, and, and, and how it will be used. Uh, when I took this job five years ago, uh, uh, U.S.-New Zealand relations were cordial. Uh, with cooperation in a variety of areas that, that recognized our historic ties, um, uh, but colored by the overhang of, of the disagreements stemming from the late, late uh, 1980s uh, about uh, uh, allowing nuclear-powered ships uh, in New Zealand ports. Today, the relationship is dramatically uh, different, characterized by, by both sides as the best in at least uh, a, a quarter century. Uh, there are many reasons for this turnabout, uh, but principal among them is that some wise people in Washington and Wellington um, decided that in the 21st century, uh, the relationship uh, between longtime friends that, that shared so much in terms of history, culture, uh, values, uh, law, economic, and, 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 and political interests should not be defined by the one or two interests uh, on which they disagreed, but rather by what they had in common. Uh, and their, their, their mutual interests in the dynamic uh, Asia-Pacific region. So uh, beginning with the, the George W. Bush and Helen Clark administrations and now accelerating in the uh, Barack Obama, John Key uh, era, uh, leaders like uh, Chris Hill and Kurt Campbell, from whom you will hear in a moment on the U.S. side, have, have, have brought the two countries to a, a new level uh, of cooperation uh, and collaboration. Um, and in addition to that, cooperation, there have been other signs of the new relationship. Um, uh, several years ago, for example, a, a, a Friends of New Zealand caucus uh, was, was, was formed in the, in the House uh, of Representatives. And, and importantly, um, uh, the United States joined, within the last year, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership trade negotiations, uh, an arrangement that, that grew out of the P4 agreement among uh, New Zealand, Singapore, Chile, and, and Brunei. Um, but it has not been government initiatives alone that, ha that have contributed uh, to the positive swing in the relationship. An event that uh, my council and our uh, New Zealand counterpart uh, started in 2006 called the U.S.-New Zealand Partnership Forum uh, is acknowledged to have made a, a significant contribution to the, 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 the improved relationship. Following the, the initial uh, forum in 2006, Clayton Yeider, who, who co-chaired for the U.S. with George Mitchell, famously described the forum as the best bilateral event I've, I've, I've seen in years, adding that he didn't recall any country ever sending that much intellectual horsepower to Washington uh, at one time. Um, Indicative of that intellectual horsepower, which has only increased in subsequent years, uh, were the New Zealand co-chairs, both former prime ministers, Jim Bolger and now Ambassador Mike Moore, 
uh, along with several ministers, the leader of the opposition, and chief executives of, of New Zealand's leading uh, companies. Uh, happily, the U.S. delegations uh, over the years have matched uh, that intellectual uh, horsepower. Uh, in 2007 in Auckland, uh, then leader of the opposition, John Key, said it makes sense to find occasions such as this, close to but not formally part of government, to allow a free flow of ideas. Um, and indeed, uh, that has been the pattern. Fifty high-level opinion leaders from each uh, country, from government, uh, business, academia, uh, media, and, and, and beyond, talking off the record and, in, and increasing the understanding between these two Pacific Rim nations of, of vastly different size, um, um, but of similar mind and energy about regional goals. So we've had three of these forums. The fourth will be in, in Christchurch uh, this coming February, which brings us back to the CSIS study. When, uh, when Ernie Bauer, who combines long expertise in, in Asia, uh, with enormous uh, energy and, and creativity. Uh, recently became the senior advisor and director for Southeast Asia programs here at CSIS. Uh, he immediately realized that no one had done a strategic study on the broad aspects of the U.S.-New Zealand relationship, um, a relationship that in recent years has been focused uh, not exclusively but primarily on, on, on trade. Uh, and given the positive turn in the relationship, that I've, I've, I've been referring to and, and, and the foundation that has been built over the past five years, uh, such a study, Ernie felt, was, was, was both necessary and, and, and overdue. Um, so he proposed to have the CSIS study, uh, 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 to have CSIS take the lead on the study, but he also proposed that it be presented at the Partnership Forum. Um, uh, he quickly ob obtained enthusiastic support from the State Department, from the New Zealand Embassy and the government, and from the two councils which agreed to fund it. Um, so the study, Pacific Partners, uh, the Future of U.S.-New Zealand Relations, will be presented at the opening session of the Fourth Partnership Forum uh, in Christchurch, uh, February 20th to the 22nd um, of 2011. Um, we are thrilled with this initiative. Um, which we think will build in the momentum and, and, and better define uh, not only the potential for the future, but also the goals uh, and ideas uh, that can allow the full uh, realization of, of that potential. So with that, I'm delighted to turn the podium over uh, back uh, to my good friend, uh, Ernie Bauer. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. And, and I'm mindful that uh, I'm between you and, and two uh, rock stars, so I will be, uh, I'll be brief. Um, what, what I'd like to do is just describe uh, what the study is about, uh, what issues it will cover, and, uh, and talk a little bit about the, the process of the study, which I think is going to be um, uh, very important. One of the, um, one of the guys I, I really respect in, in diplomacy is Tommy Coe who is the, uh, many of you know, was the U.S. ambassador here uh, in Washington and is sort of a, a minister with any portfolio he wants in the, in the Singapore and foreign ministry. And, and Tommy told me um, when he was negotiating, he was the lead negotiator for Singapore, for the U.S.-Singapore Free Trade Agreement. Ernie, you know, it's not what you come out with sometimes in these agreements, though that's important. It's how you do it. Uh, and in this case, we are winning the war with every meeting that we, we have with our two, uh, two sides. And what he meant was he's bringing the leaders uh, from the United States through, the, through our bureaucracy, people that hadn't been to Singapore before, hadn't thought about Singapore before, in contact with the Singaporean uh, colleagues um, who have, might not have thought about the United States before and have been very narrowly focused. And, you know, Tommy was right. The U.S.-Singapore relationship absolutely blossomed after that FTA negotiation, not because of the paper that they agreed upon, but because of the relationships that were built. And I, and I think that to me is a really important part of the study. <clears throat> I'm, I'm mindful of the, of the co-doctrine, and, uh, and I'm very fortunate to have people like John Mullen, um, Kurt Campbell, uh, Mike Moore, and, um, and his, uh, his predecessor, Roy Ferguson, 
uh, working with, with us on this because the energy behind this effort is very significant, and, and I will tell you that that's, that's going to make all the difference. The study, as John said, is called Pacific Partners, the Future of, of U.S.-New Zealand Relations. Um, CSIS is leading the study. We, as John mentioned, our counterpart uh, doing research in, uh, in New Zealand is the New Zealand Institute of International Affairs, uh, based in Wellington. They've got an incredible team working on, on their side. Um, each of us has broken out a study team looking into uh, with leaders looking into five areas. Those areas are trade and um, investment, security cooperation, science, technology, and education links, sociocultural ties, and transnational issues, by which I refer to issues like climate change, humanitarian assistance, and disaster relief, nuclear nonproliferation, uh, and global health, uh, to name a few. And we'll also look at the impact uh, of regional architecture on all of these areas and also the what the US New Zealand relationship can add to those uh, to the discussions of uh, regional security and trade architecture that are being built um, right now uh, as John mentioned uh, the study is funded by the US New Zealand Council and the New Zealand US Council which is based in Auckland um, obviously John's organization is based here um, and we'll present the final uh, study to the U.S.-New Zealand Partnership Forum in Christchurch, New Zealand in February. And, and we couldn't mention Christchurch without uh, saying a word about um, the suffering of, the, of our friends in New Zealand who are recovering and putting their lives and their businesses back together after the huge earthquake that hit them um, uh, just a little more than a week ago and, and I think more than 100 aftershocks. So, uh, I, I understand they're doing well and, and coping well, as, as we could expect Kiwis would, um, but uh, I know all, everybody's hearts go out to, the, to our friends there. Um, the, the study will be directed by a high-level board of advisors uh, comprised from leaders from both countries. Um, on the New Zealand side, uh, these include um, James Bolger, former Prime Minister uh, and Commonwealth Secretary. Uh, Don McKinnon, former Minister of Foreign Affairs and current um, President of the New Zealand Institute of International Affairs. Russell Marshall, former Trade Minister. Uh, I'm sorry, I got this wrong. <laughs> Bolger is uh, James Bolger, the, the Prime Minister and Council Chairman uh, of, the, of New Zealand U.S. Uh, Council. Um, Don McKinnon is the, is the former Foreign Minister and Commonwealth Secretary, um, former uh, Foreign Affairs Minister and uh, New Zealand uh, Institute President Russell Marshall, and former Trade Minister John Jim Sutton, and former Ambassador to the United States John Wood. Uh, on the U.S. side, uh, CSIS President John Hamry uh, will serve uh, U.S. New Zealand um, Council President John Mullen, who you've just heard from, the Honorable Rick Larson, who's a Democrat from uh, Washington, and former Deputy Secretary of State Richard Armitage. Uh, and there is uh, there's a two, one pending uh, confirmation that we'll announce uh, sh as soon as we get that confirmation. Um, again, the study will be published uh, in February 2011, but I hope a lot of you in this room will work with us and, and track the progress of the study. We will have um, important seminars uh, to look at the, the initial findings of the study and gather input from experts, one here in Washington, D.C. In, um, in October, uh, third week of, of October, and one in Wellington, um, I'm sorry, yeah, one in Wellington uh, in November, probably just after the, uh, after the APEC meetings in, in Japan, so we can get a significant participation. So. Um, that's the study. Uh, I would now like to call on a man who uh, um, has just arrived in Washington. Um, you talk about energy and smarts and a great sense of humor. Somebody who uh, you couldn't think of a better architect to move this relationship further. Uh, former Prime Minister of New Zealand, former Secretary General, uh, or Director General, sorry, of the WTO. Um, please join me in welcoming New Zealand Ambassador Mike Moore. Well, thank you, Ernie, uh, for that introduction. 
It's true, I have a great future behind me. Um, some people don't believe it, but it took a bit of convincing for me to come out of retirement because I discovered capitalism late in life and to come up here and to put the uniform on again. And I've done that because I think things are moving in a substantial way and I want to play a modest role in moving this thing forward. And thank you, Ernie, and thank you, CSIS, for this initiative. I have to acknowledge our uh, good mate, Kurt Campbell, for his positive leadership and his direction. And his visit to New Zealand was a very important visit and went down very well. I need, of course, to thank John Mullen. Uh, he's got out of bed. He's had both his knees fixed so he can run faster. And he's been a great colleague and friend. This study is timely, it's constructive, it will be a useful contribution to our relationship. CSIS is a, an acknowledged leader in this field because your work is robust, you have integrity, and this will be useful as a roadmap for all of us. My Prime Minister sent me up here with a very specific instruction uh, to make myself useful. I think he said bloody useful. <laughs> So I'm very pleased to be able to endorse this useful project. And as a former politician, I'm used to claiming the credit for things I've had nothing to do with. Our relationship has been growing from strength to strength. And I guess one day historians will look back with puzzlement as to why there was a period of confusion. We have so many common interests and values. To start with, we like each other. I was Minister of Tourism in the 80s and we used to survey visitors leaving New Zealand. What did they think of New Zealand? Americans leaving New Zealand in the 80s said this about us. We like New Zealand. Reminds us of America when Eisenhower was president. <laughs> I didn't know whether to be insulted or flattered. I preferred to be flattered. We do good business together. We study in each other's countries. Our scientists are breaking new boundaries together, including by developing new understandings of global climate change and joint research in the Antarctic. We work together in support of peace and prosperity in many parts of the world, just not our region. And our Prime Minister, John Key, was pleased to be able to contribute to the Nuclear Security Summit this year. Yet there is much more we could do and should be doing together. Our relationship should develop by design, by deliberate strategy, and in a thoughtful way. Therefore, I welcome the focus, the rigour, that the CSIS study will bring to the relationship, and the challenge that I hope CSIS will give policy makers in both countries to do more, to do better. We can take criticism. We welcome advice. With criticism and advice, we can lift our play. The cliches are true. We live in challenging and difficult times. We too have economic challenges at home. We have to contend with new and emerging security challenges. We live in an era of changing geopolitical relationships. We are all hostages to the future, a future we must face, not fear and face together. For those of us in the Asia Pacific, this is particularly evident. We in New Zealand are excited by the growth opportunities and potential in our region. And we have not stood still with a number of FTAs with economies of our region already under our belt, including one with China, the first developed country to conclude. We're working hard to integrate our economy into the region. When I was born, 90% of what we produced went to England. Now we're sending more to Korea than to England. We want the US to be part of this picture of regional prosperity too. We are working with the US and other regional partners in a trans-Pacific partnership. We are very ambitious. 
we want to see a high quality 21st century FTA. This is a most serious and significant regional initiative. We look forward to this study challenging us to be creative and ambitious. We see this TPP initiative as something that can be done by a group of true believers that will serve to give impetus and inspire other APEC members to build out from this progressive hub. This is doable and quicker than some people might imagine. And this is not in contradiction to our work at the WTO and to our wider APEC ambitions. Indeed, success there could send a message elsewhere. And we have a special relationship and special responsibilities with the small nations of the South Pacific. These are our brothers and sisters and cousins. They are fragile countries. They're in the lowest tier of achieving the Millennium Development Goals. They are vulnerable. They're exposed to the impact of climate change. They're vulnerable to those who would seek to exploit their resources or to use them as a haven for illicit activities. The US plays a constructive role in, this, in our region. Again, I look forward to this study identifying new, fresh, innovative ways we can work together and share ambitions. We need hard questions. We need to look at hard options. And therefore, serious forensic work needs to be done. Tommy Coe was right. The journey is almost as important as the destination. And so we hope that this journey will enable Americans to learn more about New Zealand and to refresh their knowledge of what we have to offer. Our country has changed dramatically in the last few decades. There are opportunities a lot of American businesses just wouldn't understand because every time they see a New Zealander, they think of butter and sheep meat and rugby. We are wider and we are bigger than that. Our film industry, our IT sector, we are the most open economy in the world after Singapore and Hong Kong, and they don't have any cows or sheep. Now, Secretary Clinton has said that our relationship is the best it's been in 25 years. That's true. I hope in 10 years we can look back and do another report and audit what we have done and look back with pride and satisfaction to the work you're doing as a beginning. The report is timely. It is going to be released at our next New Zealand-US Business uh, Partnership Forum that will be held in Christchurch. This report should play an important role in setting the agenda for that meeting and a future agenda. And can I thank you in conclusion for the kind words you said and other dear friends have said about the problems in Christchurch. This is my old electorate. It has been a shocker. We have been lucky. Uh, no one got hurt. 7.4, about 100 aftershocks. And I am, if I can be excused for being slightly nationalistic and chauvinistic for a minute. Our guys did well. When I rang people to see how they were getting on, the roads are broken up, the civil society went to work, the football clubs, the soldiers clubs, the fire brigade, everybody's gone to work, the government was on time, um, our earthquake and war damages commission which reinsures, reinsures and reinsures will probably be making some Swiss bankers sweat at the moment. The system began to work and I'm full with pr pride of how our citizens have behaved. Burglaries went down. <laughs> That's just not because I'm up here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ambassador. You know, uh, when I, when John Hamry uh, asked me to come to CSIS, I, it was sort of a, a gut check because like the ambassador, I was also doing other things. But I, I probably wouldn't have had the confidence to do it if it wasn't for a, a real inspiration. And that inspiration is Kurt Campbell. He, um, 
what he's doing with, with Asia policy uh, for the United States, I, I truly find inspiring. He's got a hell of a lot of challenges uh, to, in, in the toolkit that he's got to deal with. But this is a man who has real vision, uh, like the ambassador. He does it with uh, a very special style uh, and sense of humor. Uh, he has got convening power that I've never seen before, and it's just a real pleasure to work with, with Kurt Campbell. I'd like, uh, I think I don't need to go into a detailed uh, um, uh, introduction of Kurt and his background, but please join me in welcoming the Assistant Secretary for East Asia and the Pacific, Kurt Campbell. Thank you. I often notice that when people, you know, introduce folks, they say things that are nice and very grateful for Ernie. But when I get introduced, people always say things. He has a very special style, and you, and you notice in in Asia that often can go kind of both ways, if you know what I'm saying. So it's it's great to be here. I also want to just thank uh, the ambassador and John. I just there isn't one word either of them said that I wouldn't uh, support 100%, and it's great to be on this panel with them. I have to also say, just as a quick tribute to Ernie, not only is this report and this effort unbelievably timely, unbelievably timely, uh, and it is also the case that we are at the best possible place that we can be in terms of uh, 25 years, but there is so much we can do over the course of the next couple of years. And this report can uh, be a vision document, it can be a roadmap, it can help um, convene and drive this relationship over the next couple of years, and I, can't, I could not be more enthusiastic about it. I just, uh, just uh, all of you know, Ernie's been at um, CSIS for I think just about a year. Uh, I've never seen uh, uh, a person energize a set of issues more effectively than Ernie has, and it's just fantastic to work with him. And the fact that that CSIS is taking on this study at a time that we're at such a critical phase. I just couldn't be more supportive of our entire team at the State Department and the Pentagon and the White House are anxious to help and support this effort as we go forward. I have to say I was struck when, um, uh, when the ambassador was talking about tourism. I have my, my, my own tourism story, which I will just relate to you very quickly. It's so wonderful to see so many friends in the audience. One of my closest and dearest friends here is here, Peter Watson, who frankly is a, is, is a son of New Zealand and, and introduced me uh, uh, to the country. And uh, his father served with great distinction during uh, the uh, Battle of Britain and uh, just had a great uh, opportunity to get to know the country through him. Uh, I was on vacation there with him and four other fellows uh, in, uh, at the end of my time at the Pentagon. Uh, and uh, my wife, uh, I have a whole slew of daughters now, but she was uh, pregnant with our first one. It was a little bit of a difficult pregnancy, and I had to come for business, but then we took a little time subsequently. Um, she, my wife was about eight months pregnant. And I still recall we had an unbelievably wonderful time, just off the charts. And I was on the phone. Uh, Peter had a cell phone, and we were calling. And uh, my wife said, well, how's it going? And I, I was on the phone with her. And I said, I'm having the best time I've ever had in my entire life. <laughs> and uh, Peter was good enough to give me some advice subsequently <laughs> how to, how to fine-tune those talking points. Uh, so. <laughs> Unfortunately, a little too late for that particular <laughs> encounter, but uh, I want to thank Peter for his friendship and support of this relationship as we go forward. We also have to take a moment not only to recognize the challenge that the uh, people of Christ Church are facing. Uh, when I was in uh, New Zealand about a month ago, unfortunately, um, uh, we were there during the tragic uh, demise of one of uh, New Zealand's fine, finest in Afghanistan. I just want to take a moment to recognize the contributions of uh, New Zealand and the sacrifices they are making along with us uh, in critical places like Afghanistan. I just want to say a couple of things, if I can, about the relationship and about where I think we need to go. Um, uh, first of all, when governments come into power, they always do studies and sort of reviews. And it seemed to us as we came into power, although there had been some initial steps taken to improve the relationship, and, and, and that effort was already well underway, and we really need to commend the good, strong work of the Bush administration and of Chris Hill. But when we did our, our, our review, it became very clear that this was a bilateral relationship that was profoundly underperforming. 
And when John very delicately said when we were divided by just a couple of issues, the truth is it was one issue. In fact, and in every other issue when it comes to uh, issues of, of, of poverty, of climate change, of regional uh, architecture, uh, New Zealand has been a, a friend, a supporter, a sounding board, and it was very clear to us that we needed to take steps to move beyond some of the challenges that we have faced over the last 25 years on nuclear-related matters and focus more on the issues that unite us than those that are uh, difficult or challenging, that one issue. And so we've put that issue aside and we are focusing now on the issues that are most important for us as we move forward. Um, that doesn't mean in any way that that, that particular issue, the nuclear issue, uh, is not a difficult one. It is. But there are so many other matters that uh, really require a closer coordination uh, and uh, cooperation uh, between the United States and New Zealand. Uh, what we've seen over the course of the last couple of years is a deeper uh, interaction at the highest levels. Uh, Ambassador more delicately said that uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, Prime Minister Key uh, came up and made a contribution uh, uh, at the nuclear summit. I would go well beyond that. Uh, I was there at the nuclear summit. One of the key players who animated the discussions, who drove the deliberations with, was Prime Minister Key already a key player on the international stage. And he developed real chemistry um, with uh, President Obama. And I was struck at how uh, important New Zealand's contribution was on nuclear issues. And I must say, in many respects, what, what we saw with the nuclear summit was uh, the United States and other countries really adopting an agenda that New Zealand has championed for decades. And so in many respects, it was a validation of the strong, clear principles of, uh, uh, of nuclear security and nonproliferation that New Zealand has believed in, has made part of their uh, national policy for decades. And I was, I, I think I, I was, it was a very welcome development, and I cannot imagine a more f effective prosecutor of those national policies than Prime Minister John Key. Um, in addition, we've had a series of interactions at the Pacific Island Forum, and those uh, meetings uh, have been critical for us. I think one of the things that we've heard, not only from Australia and New Zealand, is that the United States needs to profoundly step up its game in the Pacific. And if you look over the course of 20 years, we have essentially walked away from some of our most important historic, strategic, and moral commitments to the Pacific. Uh, areas where uh, our forefathers, my father, fought, uh, and uh, Americans died and, and worked uh, uh, towards uh, bringing a better future to. Uh, New Zealand has been one of those countries that has urged the United States to uh, play a more active role, not just in the security of the Pacific, but in the prosperity, uh, in the humanitarian challenges that many of these poor small island nations face. Uh, and we are trying to do so. You will notice that uh, later this uh, month, Secretary Clinton will be meeting with all the heads of the Pacific Island uh, states and will be underscoring our return uh, in some uh, measure to the Pacific. We are restarting our USAID missions in the Pacific, something that had been suspended several years ago. That is a specific recommendation from our New Zealand friends. And we look to work on a range of issues uh, going forward uh, uh, in the islands uh, in particular. Um, when you look at the issues that we have the potential to work on going forward, I just want to uh, underscore a few of them. Clearly, a lot of follow-on work associated with the nuclear summit. Again, uh, Prime Minister Key helping drive the agenda uh, in terms of what's next and the subsequent meeting in South Korea. Uh, New Zealand will be playing, playing a key role uh, there. We are um, uh, continuing to work closely together the challenges that we're facing now in Afghanistan. And again, very grateful for the support on the ground uh, from uh, our New Zealand friends. So we are working to engage in uh, not only uh, uh, some exercises, but also some sharing of critical information on uh, the issues that we're facing in Afghanistan uh, uh, per se. Uh, we are also uh, working much more closely on uh, regional security and, re and political issues in the Asian Pacific region overall. If you look at um, the uh, travel patterns and engagement, uh, for instance, of China, 
um, the level of engagement that China has with New Zealand is uh, quite extraordinary. And in many respects, we can learn from New Zealand friends about their own engagement on political and trade issues. And so we are beginning a series of discussions with uh, uh, New Zealand about the larger Asian Pacific region, something that we've done in an ad hoc manner in the past, but we're hoping to do in a more um, structured way going forward. Um, we are uh, trying to work with New Zealand on critical issues, new cutting edge uh, security and political matters like climate change. Clearly this is an area, again, where New Zealand, like nuclear issues in the past, New Zealand is on the cutting edge and we uh, are uh, looking forward to that closer coordination going forward. We, um, the ambassador talked, I think, uh, powerfully about the TPP. And I, I, I don't think there's much I can add to that, only that we will look for New Zealand to help drive us, to provide inspiration, uh, and to support this effort. And we share his view that this can be a critical ingredient in uh, an effective, optimistic, outward-looking economic agenda of the United States. And it's just absolutely essential. And one of the reasons that the ambassador is here, and when he talks about coming back into public service and putting on the uniform, he believes his, uh, one of his key roles will be to drive this uh, negotiation forward. And we welcome that. We support that, and we are heartened by it. And I look forward to personally to engaging with him on this critical effort in the months ahead. And then uh, finally, uh, New Zealand has been a, a big supporter of the United States in terms of architecture. If you look at Europe, for instance, you have really dramatic innovations over the course of the last 30 years in terms of architecture. Asia has been relatively slow uh, to build the kinds of deep uh, organizational institutions that will help drive uh, the future uh, in terms of uh, politics and security and economics. And it was New Zealand, among other countries, that really encouraged the United States to take a role and join the East Asia Summit. And we're grateful for that. We are having consultations with uh, New Zealanders about that role ahead. If, if I can just say a word about what I think is going to be important for this study going forward. One of the things that I am struck by in government is how much uh, structured uh, mechanisms drive the agenda of government. So, so if you look at, uh, at, at what uh, our senior officials do, they spend an inordinate amount of time engaging with our friends in Europe. Now, Europe is extremely important, critical for our, uh, 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 our future and our past, but um, uh, the bilateral and multilateral mechanisms that are, that are in place really provide, in many respects, a calendar of engagement. And so one of the things that I would look for in this study are recommendations about structure, recommendations about specific meetings that will help organize the effort of both of our governments. I can't think of a more timely report. I want to, again, uh, uh, commend CSIS. I, see the wonderful president of CSIS, John Hamry, is here. We followed him. I was just got back from uh, Beijing, and every meeting I had, the, the senior leader would say, well, you know, we just heard from Dr. Hamry, and he said X. And so we were all taking notes, trying to make sure that our talking points matched his. Um, uh, grateful for his leadership on this effort. We think this is absolutely essential. Uh, we, we scanned the literature. There's really been nothing like it for a considerable period of time. This is really a unique opportunity uh, and very grateful for Ernie uh, and for the entire, entire team in taking this on. And we look forward to working closely with him uh, in this, not only the, the, uh, the, as he said, the Tommy Co. principle, not only the ultimate outcome, but the process itself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, we have time for uh, uh, several questions, uh, but we'll, we will wrap up at the end of the hour. So uh, just usual rules. Uh, please just identify yourself and the organization you're with. Uh, I think I saw the hand in the back, and then we'll Hi, go to you. Hi. How are you? Tani Lohan for Scoop New Zealand. Welcome, Mr. Ambassador. I appreciate the words that you've all said about Christchurch, about the earthquake, and I know the State Department has done a lot. I've been trying to find out whether President Obama has called pri the Prime Minister or called anybody in New Zealand or whether he plans to. And is the U.S. giving any direct help to New Zealand right now? Well, I, I, 
I almost found out about the earthquake because the US ambassador in Wellington rang me. And Kurt rang and people are ringing and I'm just overwhelmed with the, uh, the solidarity that's been shown. I don't know, frankly, whether the President himself has rung, but we were asked to pass on his, his uh, thoughts and solidarity with our people. Um, so we are very, very pleased with what we've heard from all our friends uh, in the States, at all levels, at all levels, from the highest to the, to the chap in the restaurant. Hi, Foster Klug with the Associated Press. I was hoping to ask um, uh, Secretary Campbell a, sto uh, a question about another big story in Asia, um, the uh, political meetings in North Korea. Um, what does the United States expect from these meetings? Um, do you see them as pivotal? Do you see them as um, not changing much uh, in the scheme of things? And also on the uh, nuclear talks, um, does the United States need uh, an apology or an admission of guilt from North Korea before those talks can go forward? Thanks. Um, thank you. I'm happy to answer the question. I do want us to focus um, most of the session, if at all possible, on New Zealand. We'll have lots of opportunities subsequently. I think the, the meeting you're talking about is the party congress that's taking place in, in, in North Korea. Uh, to be perfectly honest, we're uh, also uh, watching uh, 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 for the uh, uh, next couple of days about what to expect, and there have been lots of reports uh, about uh, uh, possible introductions of, uh, uh, of the uh, Kim Jong-il's son uh, and some role that he may be playing. Uh, the, in truth, we have really no um, indication one way or the other, and we are uh, watching like others in Asia. Um, I think uh, it would be fair to say that uh, we are in the process of deep consultations, not just with our allies, but uh, also with uh, others in the surrounding region about next steps associated uh, with North Korea. Uh, Ambassador Bosworth and Ambassador Kim uh, will be in Asia next week. Uh, I think uh, we uh, uh, believe that it will be critical uh, for uh, there to be some uh, element of reconciliation between uh, the North and the South uh, for any process to move forward. And we've communicated that very uh, clearly uh, to uh, all parties involved. Yeah, uh, my, my fault. I should have said it at the outset, please do focus on, uh, on New Zealand questions for this, for this meeting. Sean? Thanks. Uh, Sean Tandon with AFP. I'll, I'll stick to, to New Zealand on this, uh, both for Secretary Campbell and for uh, the Ambassador. Uh, I know you mentioned that you want to move beyond just the one disagreement, but what about that disagreement, the, the nuclear issue? Um, is there a way for the U.S. and New Zealand to be full-fledged allies despite the disagreements on, uh, on the nuclear issue? And perhaps has uh, President Obama's stance changed the dynamic? Well, I think Kurt made the point. Um, there is a, a difference, but it's not such a big difference that it stops us cooperating just about every other corner of the world, and that, distant, that difference stays. Uh, but here's, here's the truth. In Afghanistan and in all sorts of places, uh, New Zealanders are working alongside Americans, and we're in places where America is not, but where America's interests are involved, but we can do the job, whether it's Timor, whether it's Solomon Islands or whatever. So um, I'm not saying things have moved away, but they have moved forward. And we find all these points of light where we cooperate. This may well be a subject for historians to puzzle about in the future. I, I would just simply say I think that um, uh, the United States and New Zealand currently are the closest possible of friends. And we share, and I think one of the things that we are finding in our initial discussions about a range of issues is um, how uh, close our uh, regional, global, uh, economic, and strategic perceptions are about the way forward. Um, uh, in fact, I will, I will tell you quite honestly, uh, the United States and New Zealand see the world uh, in such similar terms, in fact, in many respects, much closer than uh, some countries that uh, would be described as formal allies in the current environment. 
Um, I'm, I think I'm heartened by that, and I think it's a fantastic foundation to build on to move forward. I'm Dick Allen. Um, I, 48 years ago, I had the pleasure of turning the key in the door of a building um, in Georgetown that started the Center for Strategic Studies, then at Georgetown, and now CSIS. And um, at that time, I stepped aside after turning the key in the door to allow Admiral Arlie Burke and David Abshire, my two colleagues, and uh, a secretary in. We were four people. Admiral Burke was a great admirer of New Zealand, and Admiral Burke uh, had many friends there. The study uh, probably represents the culmination of his feelings, and I commend all of those involved with it, since I know several of them indeed quite well. I also respond to Mike Moore's blogs, but he stopped writing his blog when he was named ambassador. Uh, I live in New Zealand, and um, I'm also affiliated with uh, this institution on its advisory board and with the Hoover Institution. I lecture at the University of Otago uh, in New Zealand, New Zealand's oldest university, not far from Christchurch, which is a competing university. Um, and I'm also a grape grower in the Gibson Valley, which is the way I'd like to identify myself on shows like Kim Hill, uh, 9 to noon, and in my editorials that are op-eds that I write for the Otago Daily Times. So I watch both places. We spend many months in both, both the United States uh, and in Washington, and I know Washington's ways. I've served as national security advisor here at home and uh, international economic and trade advisor to President Nixon at the time, uh, and I go way, way back. This relationship is key. And uh, it's appropriate that we have a John Key and a Bill English and a Murray McCulley, uh, all extremely able individuals who are completely dedicated, I'm sure, to this process, uh, just as, as Mike is and Kurt is on this side. And I'd like to commend also, uh, and this would be an exception on many, uh, in many areas of today, the uh, work of Secretary Clinton I would hope uh, aided and abetted by Kurt in every respect and at each initiative for having uh, taken steps to restore a relationship with our allies in the region and with our partners in the region, such as uh, Singapore, especially Tommy Koh, who has long been an advocate of no longer being neglected. So this, this Trans-Pacific Partnership gives great hope here. I was uh, sat with Jim Sutton the night that, uh, of the uh, uh, free trade agreement with China many years ago and was surprised that here it was, little New Zealand at four million people signing a free trade agreement with China, yet cannot get one as of yet with the United States. The difficulties lie in the Congress, and if uh, that long-winded explanation might help uh, lead to the question, what will be done about the United States Congress? Because it's the United States Congress that will impede and prohibit, based on present uh, interests, uh, any trans-Pacific partnership that involves an additional five or six free trade agreements, when not even the Mexican free trade agreement <laughs> can be implemented fully, um, and we have others that are on the doorstep, such as the ROK, uh, much less now begin with five or six new ones of many regions that we don't really fully understand and know much about. I apologize for the length of that, but the question encapsulates, encapsulates lots of difficulty and lots of work, maybe even beyond Secretary Campbell's uh, tenure over the next four, he thinks, eight years, but I'm not so sure. Well, it was a Plato who said man is essentially a political animal. None of us underestimate the politics, and there are friends in this room who can assist us with this. We have to carry the load as well. There's a responsibility on us, the partnership members. And while I've um, listened to the arguments, you keep thinking and learning. We must get Tommy Coe down, and he, he can run a good dinner. 
uh, we must apply the multiplier effect to all the partners. And if you, I remind you, um, Australia, Singapore, Brunei, most likely Vietnam, Peru, Chile, this is getting a critical mass. And I've learned that we don't know everything. Um, if we were so clever, we would have done it. And we were, st we were studying carefully how the Aussies and Chile and others did it. Uh, we are meeting as a group. We understand that we have to do the work. And we have friends in high places, well, friends in a couple of low places as well. Uh, all that we will be asking you, sir, and other dear friends at certain times to make the case. But this is about everybody winning. And this is about a group I like to call the true believers, who are adults, who want to do something serious about the 21st century, to produce a model going right back to supply lines, the whole deal. Um, in the WTO, we compromise a lot. In APEC, we compromise a lot. Let's get something up here of, of stunning substance uh, that can be announced at a certain time, which I hope will edge the work in Geneva and prove an inspiration to others in APEC. To me, this is an enormous disappointment. I thought the Doha round was going to do it. It hasn't, unfortunately, yet. But this is not a contradiction to Doha, nor is it a contradiction to APEC. But we have to do the work as well. We understand. This is a complex town, huh? Um, we understand. We have to do our share. Having best friends is not enough. First of all, let me just kind of just say a word, just thank um, uh, uh, Richard for his service and also uh, uh, for his uh, prodding over decades about this relationship. I remember he came to see me when I was in the Pentagon in the 1990s and urged then we needed to do more with New Zealand. And uh, I guess this would be in one of those uh, categories, Richard, of better late than never. And it's in many respects a fulfillment of your commitment to the relationship. And I have not tasted the wine from your vineyard, but I look forward on the next trip down. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come in February and I'll look forward hopefully to open a open a bottle with you on that. If I can just say just one thing, and I, again, I understand all the complexities of the politics of trade and economic engagement. I, I spend my life in Asia. I, I spent a lot of time on the road. I was, uh, again, with John, we were uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, China. Uh, anyone who does not understand the drama that's playing out in Asia in terms of trade and economics, and that uh, uh, many countries in Asia want more, not less, of the United States. And they want us off the sidelines. They want us to be traditionally, as we have been, optimistic, not anxious. Uh, they want us uh, uh, committed on uh, the, the, the playing field of uh, Asia's uh, trade, uh, macroeconomic and uh, other economic playing fields. And uh, it's just an inexorable uh, logic of our engagement. And so I, all, we all recognize some of the difficulties. My own personal view is that the United States has to understand the imperative uh, of, of this kind of engagement. And I agree with the ambassador on TPP. And I must say, uh, I see his hand at work already in terms of bringing people together, making the logic for a high quality engagement, underscoring that the region will not wait. It will not wait for us. It, it, it has slowed down a little bit so that we can get on, but it's not gonna wait very much longer. And we need to understand uh, uh, the imperative uh, that rests right in front of this generation of Americans. And that's one of the reasons that, frankly, we were so grateful that the, that the government decided to go and uh, have Mike suit up again to come up and serve his country so effectively on an issue that, frankly, we all are looking to to help us uh, uh, chart this new course. I'd like to, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to do uh, additional questions. We've gone over time and we won't be able to do these things if I keep these guys over time. They won't come back. <laughs> so uh, so right. thank you all for coming. A particular thanks. Oh, Could sorry. I give you one other, just as we conclude, one other yep. suggestion, Ernie. I think there is enough of a community that you might want to consider doing a uh, 
a relatively regular lunch or meeting in which you have people speak about the issues that are um, animating uh, the U.S.-New Zealand relationship, the, what, the role that New Zealand plays, I think it would be very valuable to go forward. And that's, that would be something that I think, in addition to this overall effort that you're, sorry to interrupt your. No, no, that's good. And, and we'll work with John Mullen uh, on that initiative. Uh, I think that, that's a great recommendation. Thank you, uh, Ambassador. Thank you, Kurt Campbell. Thank you, John Mullen.